everyone. Thanks for joining us with today's message at Revolution Church. We're so glad that you're here. Whether it's your first time or your hundredth time, we believe that God has a word for you today. Our prayer today is that you feel more connected to his word, his people, and his church. Thanks for tuning in. I'm excited, man. Last week we talked about, we started the um, story of Christmas, the real story of Christmas, and uh, we looked at the life of Mary. Mary was visited, if you weren't here, uh, Mary was visited by an angel to say, hey, you're six months pregnant, and guess what? It, that's from the Lord. You're char- carrying the child of God. And what I hoped we had walked away with last week was that, that we need not to let common sense talk us out of faith, Okay. That, that we're called to, that the way God operates hardly ever makes sense. And there's so many people handcuffed and, and led astray by trying to make logic instead of faith, okay? So that's what I hope that we would walk away with last time, that we would choose faith over logic. So we're going to pick back up um, where she's getting closer to having the baby. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the manger scene and all that a little more later uh, on Friday. But I want to be in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, start there. We're talking about the nativity story. It just means the story of birth. It's it's the birth. It's the birth and the setting of the birth and all that. Um, It's uh, Luke 2, chapter 1. I mean, chapter 2, verse 1. And the Bible says this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. They had occupied a lot of the known world at the time there. And the Bible says that this was the first census that uh, took place while Kiernis, the governor of Syria, and uh, in case you were wondering about that, and everyone went to their own town to register, right? So they had to return back to their city of origin to do a census. They want to know what they're dealing with, how many people are where, and and so they can figure out what taxes were going to be, all that type of stuff. Verse 4 goes on to say, so Joseph who went up from the town of Nazareth, that's where he was living, in Galilee to Judea, specifically to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged in the house and line of David. Verse 5 says, He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him. Okay, they're kind of like engaged to him. She was expecting a child, and we know all about that because we were here last week, right? And so verse 6 says, And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, which was a son. So we'll pause there and, and get back on verse 6 again in a minute. But I want to lift some scripture out for you today that I thought would be helpful to know. To know the story, uh, the, the Christmas story accurately. Okay? So that we can really absorb, man, what God wants us to know about. It's important to know the origins of what God did in, this, the, the, uh, at, at, in the beginning of, of Jesus' life. So, and this is what I wanted, want you to pay attention to in Luke chapter 2, verse 6. While they were there, everybody say there. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Let's pray. Father, would you open up? Would you illuminate your word, God? Would you, um, God, make it have some clarity, Lord, so we can actually apply this to our life. God, so we can know you more intimately, Lord, that we could understand our purpose in this life. God, and that we will be a light to the world. God, so that people could come to know you and have a relationship with you, God. So we just thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Okay, I love to be, I'm going to be transparent for a second. I love this time of year where you can talk about, everybody's talking about Christmas right now, right? It's an easy uh, message. You don't have to do much preaching, to be honest. I like it. Uh, But sometimes, specifically at Christmas, uh, there's a challenge, though, because a lot of people have heard 
they know the story. Even if you've never been in church before, if you don't, you know, the first time you've ever been here or anywhere, um, you kind of know the story of Jesus. So there's this tendency to become too familiar with it. What do I mean by that? What I mean is sometimes you hear something so much and sometimes you don't attach some action to what you've heard, some application to what you've learned, that it creates some callousness, uh, some spiritual callousness, and and you just kind of learn to just glaze over it. But every time you read something, if you went tomorrow and heard another pastor talk about the same set of scripture, man, every time you should hear something different that challenges you, that inspires you, something along those lines. So the challenge is... Uh, is to to really make it where you uh, receive it and perceive it and, and that you apply it and that, that even though you might have some familiarity with it, that you would still value it, okay? We do that in relationships a lot of times. Sometimes we don't value the people that we know the most. And it's because we know them the most. And so same thing can happen here. So I'm hoping you're here in a, I'm not just hoping, I'm praying that you'll hear something fresh, something new, something to revive something in you, something that's impactful, but you've got to participate in it. So your posture, your mind, and your heart matters right now, okay? It matters right now. So uh, I'm going to try to bring some value to something that you're probably familiar with. So I want to lift this something out that stood out to me um, in the time that we have. And I want you to be better when you hear this. I want you to uh, uh, pick up on your new assignment. I, I like it when you think about, man, when we talk about theirs, what we're talking about today, and we'll explain that. Uh, that when you pass by on Franklin Boulevard and you pass by, you said, man, I heard from God there. You know, that's where I can go and I know I can be encouraged is there, okay? That's what I want you to kind of uh, absorb today. So we've been praying and preparing for this, this, these last few messages and the the ones upcoming. So this is the phrase that kind of I want to lift for you today. It's Luke chapter 2, verse 6, and it says, while they were there, while they were there. Now, we, we know that there, there, is Bethlehem. That's where that's referring to. And uh, I, I think that when we, by the time we finish today, you're going to uh, be able to relate. I love God's Word because it helps us to relate. Uh, he knows where we are. He knows what we're up against. And He wants us to relate and apply. So I'm going to talk about Bethlehem. That's where they are. That's where uh, we're talking about today is is Bethlehem. Now, Mary and Joseph were on their way there, okay? And it wasn't like a baby moon. Do y'all know what a baby moon is? I, I didn't realize this till later, after I had kids. Uh, you know, there's honeymoon, like I'm, I'm getting married and I'm going on a vacation and whatever, you, you hold hands on vacation, I don't know, on a honeymoon. But a, a baby moon is like, man, we're about to have this baby, life's about to change. Let's go do something fun one last time. Okay, so this was not a baby moon. This was something that was forced on them. This wasn't a vacation uh, or anything like that. It, it's just kind of what uh, they were ordered to do. They were forced by an, an oppressive government. Their government said, you have to go. Too bad. Nine months pre- pregnant, too bad. You're going. And, um, and so they had to go. And it was a, a long trip for them for where they was going. It was about 150 miles. Okay, so you've got this pregnant um, Nine months pregnant, not three months pregnant. Uh, a woman that's going to be, she's 15 years old, we, we learned last week, thereabouts. So this is going to be a, a tough trip. But the, the Roman Empire had taken over most of the known world, and they were uh, making sure that, uh, that people were getting to where they're supposed to be. And so they were essentially refugees. Everybody was traveling. Everybody was going. Everything that comes along with that. So this was a multi-day trip, obviously for Joseph and Mary, uh, and, and she's really, really pregnant. And ladies, men will never, will never understand the physical discomfort and the, the anxiety of having, especially your first child, right? And uh, so all that's going on, right? Just because in the Bible doesn't mean that that stuff's not real. Um, and I'm sure she's filled with worry and anxiety um, just to generally being pregnant anyway. And there's a lot of pressure on her because this angel says, in your stomach you're carrying uh, the child of God okay so no pressure and then Joseph he's never had a baby before you know there's anxiety that comes with that as a man as well and and he knows it's not his baby he realizes that he was visited by the angel too that confirmed that um that it, that it was she was um uh, that the whole that it was the Holy Spirit and so anyway 
Uh, they're traveling. I'm, I'm sure they stopped at every exit on the way. You know what I'm talking about? When women are pregnant, they got to pee. They just got to go. And they need a break. And so I'm sure that all of that, and I'm going to get to the point that Bethlehem's not all it's cracked up to be. And not to mention that while they're on their way, they're actually planning on going to stay with their in-laws, okay? They're going to Bethlehem, and what we know, we'll find out about Bethlehem, it only has about 300 people there, right? So it's a very small town anyway, and she's going, and she's pregnant, and she's, they're going to stay with, um, it's forced on them, and they're going to stay with hopefully some in-laws. And I just want to show you how bad the situation was with Bethlehem, where they were. Okay, and I I think you're going to relate, but it was a place that they didn't want to go. It was a place that was forced on them, and it and it it was anything but a vacation. So I want you to write this down. Bethlehem, the place that they were, that they were going, was a place of frustration. Write that down. Some of you say, "Man, I'm I'm gonna really relate to this because I feel like I'm in a place. Maybe it's not geographical, but I'm in a place in my life I didn't expect to be or want to be, and it's frustrating." Okay, so this. This trip here, we just try to describe it. So, uh, and like I said, going to see their in-laws. Now, my in-laws are amazing. They're amazing. I say that every chance I get. Now, maybe your in-laws are bad, but um, but I'm sure she's not looking forward to this. And um, But if we were going to be honest, we'd say, man, I'm frustrated right now. I'm in a place in my life that I don't really want to be. And so maybe when you started 2022, man, you had hopes and dreams some plans for this year that just didn't pan out, all right? Maybe it was financial goals or some health goals. and Maybe something happened, man. Like, like me, I didn't plan on a heart attack. I didn't plan on that. That was my Bethlehem. That was my frustration, right? But maybe it was you were trying to get a new job or lose weight. You thought you'd be in a relationship right now, even married by this point, right? But I wish you'd write this down, and maybe it might not pop up on your screen, but... When you're at some place that you don't want to be, it leads to frustration. Okay, that, that is the case for whatever our scenario is. And here's, and, and Joseph and Mary were there. Okay, so they're rolling into Bethlehem, and there's no way they're not fighting on the way. I'm sure his feet hurt. I'm sure she's tired and riding that donkey or whatever it was she was riding. Um, it's just where they didn't want to be. So it's not just a place, Bethlehem is not just a place of frustration. Bethlehem's a a place of rejection. Write that down, rejection. And while they were there in Bethlehem, it's not like the song, you know, we sing the songs and hear the songs at Christmas, old little town of Bethlehem, things like this. It sounds like just a perfect environment, but um, I'm, I'm trying, I'm supposed to go to Israel at the end of January. It's a, I'm really looking forward to it. I've always thought about going. I never thought I'd get a chance to go. Uh, but already getting emails and talking back and forth with uh, somebody that says that, you know, telling where we might be going and, what you know, what's on the schedule to go. And he was pretty honest. He said, you know, there's Bethlehem. We'll go. It's fine. It's not my favorite place. There's not a lot there, he said. And it kind of, it's kind of got a smell to it even. It's so bad that it even kind of stinks a little bit. If you, if you, we'll stop and I'll let you smell it. But there's not a lot there. Um, but it's it's Bethlehem. And so, So not only do they not want to be there, you're going to see with this rejection thing, a place you don't want to be with rejection, um, not only they don't want to be there, the people there don't really want them there, okay? And so, like I said, Bethlehem has about 300 people in it during this time, and it's kind of the armpit of Israel, all right? And so, but Bethlehem makes Bessemer City look like New York City, you know what I'm saying? That's kind of the the dynamics there, not... You know, they don't want to be there, and they can't leave there. And it's not like they're going into town, into Bethlehem, where there's hotels and motels, and they just have no vacancy signs. That's not it at all. And I love this part. Every year, I don't miss a chance to talk about it, about what it does look like when it says there's no place, and some of your versions say, in the end. Okay, so there's no hotel, nothing like that. I want to talk about that just for a second. There are guest rooms. When your Bible says there's no room in the inn. Um, every, everybody tried to have a, it was just good hospitality um, in their culture to have, when their house was built, it had kind of three stages to it. They tried to build it on the side of a little slope so that the main floor was the main floor. That's where everything, most things happened. But they also had an upper room. 
an upper room was for any guest that would come by and ask, to, can I stay in your upper room? And it wasn't like a law, but it was considered rude to not offer that up to a guest. It would be better than your bedroom if you owned the house. It's better than yours. It shows honor. It, it Just in position of being the upper room, it's a higher priority. And so you would offer that to any strangers that come by. Um, that's what you would do, and you'd be proud of that, right? You would gladly do it. It looks good. Your hospitality was kind of like your wealth, okay? And so that's, what, that's just what they did, and it was the upper room. It was the place of honor. Upper rooms are talked about a good bit in Scripture. Uh, in, in ancient times, they, they just didn't do um, hotels. There were a lot of people traveling, and that's just what you did. You know, a lot of us, we like, hey, you know, we're remodeling, so we don't really have any room or you know, we're out of town that week or whatever. No, back in these days, you'd use the upper room. And uh, even to, even when Jesus, during some of his last days, he, he told some of his disciples, go to town and find an upper room, right? That's where the uh, Last Supper and things like that kind of happened. And so uh, there's a lot of examples of that. But it was really important to host guests and to honor them, right, uh, when, when they came through. So I love talking about that. It's a nice little detail. So... But at the bottom of the house or around kind of the back on that slope, it would naturally be, the way it was built, have some covering to it. And that was so livestock could come in from wherever they were during the day. They could get out of the rain and they'd come in there and rest or whatever, right? And so that's what was available to them. And, and so when we see them coming to town, I'm sure Joseph was like, honey, when we get there, I know everybody. I, everybody knows me. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely have a place to, to stay. But when they get there, something happens, and there's no room. Now, it's very likely that a lot of people were going home and they're just full. Hey, our upper room's just taken right now, right? It could be that. But it could also just as well be that, hey, when he shows up, like at his family's house, say, hey, we're here. We're here for that census. And he's not married yet. He's not married, and he's there with his not-yet wife. And she's obviously nine, very pregnant, nine months pregnant. Right, and so it's very likely that that's that would be a a dis, dishonor, man. You're not even married. It's not just taboo like it is today, or uh, but it was actually against the law. So they don't want to be associated with that. They don't look like they're inviting anything like that. So they would uh, say, "Hey, I tell you what, you can stay around back with the animals if you want to. That's all I got. That's all I got for you, man." And so that's what. Uh, very well could have happened. Either there's no way, but of course we knew what God was doing the way he came into the world. I think was, um, you know, when we read from Scripture, how much glory he'd get and how much how much he ha He humbled himself for our sake, right? So you, you kind of fill in the blanks there, but um, it was doubtful that it was because they were strangers. It's most likely because they're not married and uh, they were being rejected. So that's what we're talking about, man, is... One, it's a, man, this Bethlehem thing, where I am right now in life, it is, um, man, it's frustrating where I am right now. And now, if you ever felt that way, man, where I am in life, man, I feel like I'm constantly getting rejected, door slammed in my face, a bunch of no's, I just can't make any progress, right? So it's also a place of rejection. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've knocked on every door and you've tried things, but you're just not moving forward like you thought, right? And, and um Maybe that's a career path. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's something like that. But, but Bethlehem is a place of rejection. So um, I was wanting to jump down to this. Is You know, um, that they're, I'm sure they're freaking out. This is their first kid, and she's probably really upset that they're sitting down here in this, this barn or around back, around bottom with the animals. And, you know, instead of a sterile hospital somewhere, you know, something that's more appropriate, right? Uh, but it's in the middle of that, in the middle of, the Bible says, while they were there, that a baby shows up. The place stinks. They're kind of, uh, people may have disowned them. They're feeling, I'm sure they're feeling very disconnected. But the baby shows up, and, and it's healthy, and they're excited, all of that. But just when things look like they're on the upswing, all right? Just when they push through all of that, they find out, the Bible tells us, that there was a guy, and his, he's the leader of the province at the time. His name was King Herod, okay? 
And he heard there was a boy born in Bethlehem. It was prophesied that this boy was going to be born and he would deliver hope to the people, right? And a king back in those days were always very paranoid, right? There was always somebody they thought trying to kill him, dethrone him, uh, discredit him, anything like that. And so the, the response to that was just to remove the threat, just to kill him. And that's exactly what he did. So the, this insecure King Herod decided that, hey, man, he doesn't know which baby it is. All he knows is it's a, So we're just going to slaughter all the baby boys in town. So not only are they experiencing frustration and rejection, now they're facing opposition. So Bethlehem is a place of opposition. There's somebody trying, literally trying to kill their baby. Okay? So the, they disperse like the military of the time to kind of go door to door, look for this baby. Let's go look for this baby boy and just... We're just going to kill them. We're going to remove the threat. So they were literally in a place where they were under attack. I don't know if you felt that way before where I doubt maybe somebody's trying to literally kill you, but you're in that terrible place, man. Maybe it's your marriage that's under attack. You're like, where's this coming from? Right? Maybe it's some type of relationship you have. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's a spiritual attack. You can just, what is going on? Just feeling attacked and, and you feel in opposition. Man, you're trying to live for God. You're trying to do the right thing. And sometimes there's just opposition to that, man. And so, so I love this. Let me read it again now that we've got some context. So what Bethlehem is really like, it's not like the song. It's not like the pictures. Okay, this is rough. This takes a lot of obedience and a lot of, man, I'm trying to do what God called me to do. I'm running into all these things. You're not immune to that when you're following Jesus. And matter of fact, just to be honest with you, you invite that to yourself by being obedient. Right? It's like, Richard, are you trying to talk me out of faith or into it? I'm just being honest to what, what it is. But this story, man, I love the way this story. So let me just read it, Luke 2, 6 again. While they were there in Bethlehem, the place of, of frustration and rejection and opposition, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. So it's in the middle of all of this stuff is that when God shows up. That's what that means. And some of you, man, you've heard of church services. They'll call it, actually call it an Advent service. Advent, there's a definition on the screen. Uh, it just means that it's the appearance, okay, the arrival of, some, of somebody, something, some event, right, that's supposed to be kind of life-changing, okay? And that's the Advent of Jesus it's him it's God showing up it's saying that God is appearing and that's what that means and it's and so write this down advent happens in the middle of adversities and adversaries that's what this story tells us it's not uh that when he doesn't show up in the absence of trouble he doesn't show up in the absence of darkness and struggle right when everything's going right advent happens God shows up when it, it was literally hell on earth for Mary and Joseph. That's supposed to be some good news to you. Is that some of y'all, man, you're struggling. Some of that you it's self-inflicted. Maybe you made a bad decision, whatever. A lot of times it's just not. It's nothing you did. It's nothing that, that a bad decision you made. It was nothing intentional. It's something that where it just happens, right? And... And I'm sure Joseph and Mary looked at each other and thinking, what the heck is going on? Have you felt like that before? I'm trying my best to do what I'm called to do, I'm trying to provide for everything, but I keep experiencing this type of thing. But that's, that's when the Bible's example over and over, that's when God shows up. That's when he becomes apparent. And some of you men are having a tough time really celebrating Jesus other than, you know, kind of what, the way the world celebrates. It's fine. Um, but... To really be in touch with what's going on uh, with Jesus and really participating in, in, in what's actually going on. So write this down for yourself because y'all are so good at taking notes. You know it applies to you almost immediately. Is when things are at their worst is when God's usually at his best. So I want you to be on the lookout. Be on the lookout. Um, keep enduring. Keep pushing through. Keep being obedient to what God's called you to do. Mary was called to, hey, man, keep this child. Carry this child. Go to where we say to go. This is um, be obedient in that way. 
we're, you're still going to incur all kind of uh, adversities that, and difficulty and trouble in your life. But be on the lookout for God because it's in the middle of that when God shows up. It's where he's at his best, right? And so God shows up in the darkest moments. And John said it this way in chapter 1, verse 5. The light shined into darkness, and darkness could not overcome. So Jesus is the light of the world, and that's what God did. He gave us the gift of Jesus. He saw the darkness that we are experiencing and that we see, and, and he sent the light, and that is, that is Jesus, right? So this may be helpful to you as you're pushing through doing what God's called you to do, that just because you didn't choose where you are doesn't mean that God can't use where you are. So that, that should be encouraging to you. Now you may not have chosen the, the difficulty and battles that you're having and have had, but God is still going to use it. He's still available to that. And I would dare say that more often than not, man, the places that, that God most powerfully Use us are in a place that we didn't necessarily want to be or choose to be. Okay? So, I know that when I look back on all the, the seasons in my life and places I didn't want to be there, I wish it would pass. I wish it was move on. And I didn't know, uh, I, I don't know what there is for you when you think about that. You know, what is going on in your life? And some of you let me in on that. You didn't choose to be there. But God just happens to show up. That's where he's at his best. And we need to be reminded of that. And that's what this time of year reminds us of. That when Jesus got a, a, a nickname, Emmanuel. God is with us. His presence matters. And I wonder if some of you have God's presence in your life through a relationship with Jesus. If you've experienced that. If you surrendered those areas of your life. man. Some, most of you that I talk to, you've got something coming up. You've got something that you're in the middle of, man. New jobs, new relationships. It's about to move to the next level, whatever that is. You've got decisions to make. You've got kids on the way. You've got a lot of important stuff coming up, man. And uh, Man, I, I want you to see it as a, the priority, man, to have Jesus. He doesn't leave you alone in some of those decisions that you have to make. And I want you to look for him. I want you to, to see what he offers for you, man. And we just choose to surrender our life he's got plans and he's got purposes for us and but this story of jesus the the the, the story of his birth man if it teaches us anything man it teaches that even when we didn't choose that god will always find a way to use that season in your life for his good so should go back one more time to Luke chapter 2 verse 6 it's while they were there that the time came not after they left not after they had moved on not after they had gotten everything together and everything straightened out right um, it's not after you deal with addiction man a lot of people try to clean up first let me clean up first and then God will show up let me heal my marriage let me uh, figure some stuff out man and but it's not it's not after but while i want you to really pay attention to that so look for god look for god's presence it happens so here's the good news i always like that for you to have good news i think we've heard a lot already but where he, where he comes to us is not where he leaves us and once you to pay attention after this they never go back to bethlehem they, you can't find it in Scripture. They don't go back. It's a season, okay? And he he meets them there in that sorry place, stinky place, of apparently, called Bethlehem. But he doesn't he he doesn't leave them there. He's got a plan beyond for them beyond Bethlehem. And I I would say he has that for you too. He's got a plan beyond your Bethlehem, your stinky place, that season you're in, the frustrations and rejection in opposition that you're facing. He's got something past that. But they never went back to there. But it was while they were there that God showed himself, that he presented himself, right? So um, I would like for you to really um, participate this year in 
inviting people. Your invitation means so much. It's a part of the Christian faith. Okay, it's part of being a, a Christ follower is to invite people. You should be good inviters. Invitation on the tip of your tongue constantly. When, you, when you're out in the community, when you're at your family events, when you're you know, walking down the street, whatever it might be, that somehow you work in an invitation. I'd love for it to be for church. Not just because they come here and they'd stay a member forever, but some people are on the ropes in their life. Suicide is becoming a lot more of an accepted option to people. They're desperate. Some people's marriage, a lot of people's marriage are hanging by a string. They don't know what to do. They, don't, they have no idea. There is no hope. That's literally no hope. But you carry hope with you when you have a relationship with the Lord. So maybe it's that one invitation that they need to come in and hear some hope. And then they'll surrender things to the Lord and go to whatever church, whatever that church would be. But I'm talking about raw people interacting with them and extending an invitation, okay? And people are waiting on that this time of year. They, they even, I've, I've heard it said, man, I'm, um, I expected an invitation to go to church. I don't ever go, but I at least expected it at Christmas. And sometimes they never hear it. So maybe somebody that you've never asked before, but maybe go back to the people you have asked before. Maybe situation would change. The Lord's been working on them, right? Softening their heart. And that invitation is the only thing standing in the way of that. So maybe they can come in and hear the story of how much God actually loves them, sees them in their darkness, knows that they need light. And that is the answer. It's, it's not up to a doctor or a therapist or, you know, as long as I get a boyfriend that that'll fix everything. But that it's, that it's Jesus. And man, I promise we'll tell the story with clarity and sensitivity and, and man, in a way that is inviting, in a way that's not judgmental. In a way, hopefully, they've never heard it presented before. Okay? So that's, my, that's what I'm praying about today. Some of you, man, you've been coming a little bit, man. You, you see the Lord's pursuing you. Um, there, then maybe that, uh, that's your next step is to just enter into a relationship with the Lord. And that comes from assessing yourself compared to comparing your life to what Scripture says. And we all wind up short. Right? And, and the Bible says that Jesus, out of his own mouth, said, I came to save the world. I didn't come to condemn it. You're already condemned. We all are. Until we encounter Jesus, and that we repent of our sin, that we just turn away the best you can. God's going to give you the power to, to keep trying to do that, right? But, but maybe that's you today. We're going to have people in the back that can talk a little bit more about that with you. Uh, they're going to be available, point you to Scripture and to pray with you, something like that. If they need to come get me, they will. But they're all prayed up and ready to go. Um, so listen, uh, let's, let's go ahead and pray. Let's go ahead and pray. Can y'all stand with me? What a great message that was. But before you leave today, we want to give you the opportunity to take next steps. Whether that's to be baptized, sign up for a serve team, a life group, or give online. We want to make that easy for you. So you can check out the link below to get connected and plugged in in Revolution Church. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.